real estate training you know last week we gave you guys an overview of everything now if you missed last week then I'd say go back and take the class okay so that you don't fall behind this is a class at the end of the class there is a there is a final for the class because like in all real estate just so you know you know someone asked me this question is that you know um, we have this thing called insurance that when we when we're in real estate. And the insurance is no different than car insurance. You know, if you have five cars, do you have to register all five cars, yes or no? Yes. But the insurance that you buy also covers different things, right? There's things like just there's collision, there's things for accident, there's things for uninsured motorists. You know, does it make sense? So in commercial real estate and, and in, in real estate in general, we carry insurances for what you do. If you're one of my loan officers, obviously we have to carry the insurance that covers for loans, right? If you're in real estate, we have insurance that covers for real estate. If you do property management, when, which we don't, we carry the insurances that cover property management, right? You know, we do commercial real estate, we carry the insurance to cover that, we do business opportunity. So when we go and get commercial policies, you know, they ask us questions like, who does commercial? Do they do business opportunity? Who does loans? Who does real estate? Does it make sense? And in commercial, you know, part of risk management is you need to know what you're doing. If you're out there, you have no clue what you're doing, 
and you're just wandering in the world of commercial and you start doing gas stations or doing like really high risk types of real estate or you start doing hotels and this and that where the income for hotels are hard to calculate then guess what you could get involved in a high multi-million dollar lawsuit in no time does it make sense you can be involved in a multi-million dollar lawsuit in no time if you don't know what you're doing because Little, little forgets or little mistakes in residential, oh, can be can cost a lot, or it cannot be that bad. Does that make sense? Oh, miss this plumbing issue. Oh, miss this. You know, you can miss something really major. Like in a, in a home, what's the most major thing you can miss? AC? <laughs> 10 grand, okay? In commercial, you meet, you miss an environmental issue. Okay, you, you miss something where, where, where something affects your ability to develop, it's, it's huge. Does it make sense? Okay, so because of that, hey, hey, Mr. Druden, there's like, there's like classical music playing on my thing. That's nice. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. <laughs> You know, I don't know why classical music is playing on my thing. All right, so I don't know if people can hear it, but it, but um, but so you got to be real careful in commercial. The things that we do, the little things that you do, can cause a can cause a big problem. You know what I'm saying? So so that's why when you do this business, you need to take a class like this. You need to, you know, at least we have a foundation of this business, so you know what you're doing. Okay. All right, so today, uh, how our commercial class is broken up is there's going to be a day in our eight classes where we're going to spend the whole day teaching you on systems like LoopNet and like CoStar. LoopNet is the system that, in general, everyone can access and everyone uses, okay? So one of the first systems that we use uh, in commercial real estate is called LoopNet. Raise your hand if you've ever been to LoopNet. Or, okay, raise your hand if you okay, so good. So I think half the people in this room have been to LoopNet. Okay? And then the same day I show you what LoopNet is all about, I'll show you what CoStar is about. Raise your hand if you've ever been on CoStar. A few of you, okay? Uh, CoStar is basically the professional's commercial MLS. Okay? That's the professional's commercial MLS. So the companies that have CoStar are like the C.B. Richard Ellis, uh, you know, Cushman Wakefield, the Colliers. Normally the big, the big boys, the ones that are really serious in commercial real estate are the ones that have CoStar. The ones that aren't that serious or, or the ones that are just more residential people who have MLS and like that, they'll just play around in LoopNet. Does that make sense? But the professionals are always on CoStar, okay? And and so and a lot of the big companies, the big companies, they'll they'll just put their stuff on CoStar. They won't even put it on LoopNet. So when you're on LoopNet, you're you're seeing some listings, but you're not seeing them all. Does it make sense? When you're in CoStar, you see everything. Everything that's on CoStar owns LoopNet. So LoopNet is like you know the how can I say it? It's like sort of like a, a uh, you know, like the everyday, consumer friendly huh? It's, consumer friendly it's, a, it's a consumer site more than anything else. Whereas CoStar is the professional site, okay? So there'll be a day where I train you guys on both uh, LoopNet and CoStar. Our company has CoStar, okay? It doesn't mean you're going to have it until you get really deep into it. If you get deep into it, then you'll have your own CoStar account. Does that make sense? But CoStar costs a lot. You know, monthly is $400 a month. For you, much more for me, but but for you, it's, it's a thought. That's why you, you got to really be deep into CoStar. I mean, commercial if you're going to do it. But like I said, you know, uh, a lot of commercial agents they'll make you know million, two, three million dollars a year in this business. So what's paying a few hundred dollars a month when you're making you know hundreds of thousands of dollars every month in, in commercial? You know, I, I was I was saying that you know. In residential real estate, when you close one deal, you know, what's your check? Five, ten thousand dollars. It's not uncommon to close one deal in commercial 
and be set for the year. Does that make sense? Because it's not uncommon to get a hundred thousand dollar, two hundred thousand dollar commission in commercial real estate. Does it make sense? Okay. So so that's what I'm going to go into it. That that leads me into what we're going to train today. So today is a little bit more uh, uh, general commercial, and then we're going to get more deep into it as uh, as the class goes on. Like for example, we'll have a day where I'm going to train you guys how to do LOIs. Okay, doing an LOI, see in commercial we don't really hand, handle offers that much because there's always little details. If you if you just straight out submit an offer, you might have 10 counters. Does it make sense? Because you're countering all this type of stuff. So to, in order to avoid all the different counters, you send in an LOI. And then you go back and forth with, with, with LOIs and redlinings. And once you have everything in place, then either an attorney or you will write up the clean offer. Does that make sense? And then that's the offer you go buy. So it's not on the residential side, we write up an offer that we have counter one, counter two, counter three. In commercial, you might have 15 counters in there. Imagine trying to trace back every counter to form one contract. Does that make sense? So in, res in commercial, we do LOIs, and then we get all the, all the terms, and then once the terms are met, then boom, we have an attorney drafted up or we draft it up. Does that make sense? That's how it works, okay? And everyone agrees to it. Okay. So the question in the question in commercial real estate is where do you get your clients from? One of the questions in commercial real estate is where do the clients come from? Okay? To be honest with you, it's easier to get, I think, a commercial client, you know, than it is sometimes to get a residential client. Okay, it's easier to get a commercial client than it is to get a residential client. Because the residential client sometimes is, 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 is all luck. You know, oh, you meet someone, you run into someone who's looking to buy a home. You run into someone that's looking to, um, that's looking to sell their property. It's almost an accident. And on top of that, we talked about last week, we said, Everyone knows a realtor. Everyone knows uh, someone who's in real estate. Everyone probably has someone in their family that's in real estate. So you're not only competing with so many more people, but you're but but finding the right person is almost luck because you know you got to catch them at the right time and the right people. Whereas in commercial real estate, finding the client technically is actually easy. Finding a client in commercial technically is easy if you know how to get it. If you know how to get it, okay. Let me ask everyone something, and I'll 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 tell you guys. <clears throat> when I was in real estate, I was one of the top agents in the country. Okay, how many agents you know average one deal closing a day? I used to close a deal a day, not a month or a week. I used to close a deal every day on average, okay? And for me, it was easy. You want me to show you how? Okay, all right. So before I show you how, I, how let, me, let me just tell you about an opportunity, okay? And you tell me about, and, and you tell me what you think of the opportunity. So I, I like cars. I'm sort of into cars. But then I have a lot of friends. So one of my friends, and if you know what I'm saying, then then I've already told you already, then then just keep quiet. But no, because I told you about the deal already. But I ran into a deal. I ran into a deal. Okay. It was a brand new 80 miles on the car. Okay. Mercedes Benz S550. Okay. The car is a sticker price for the car is $115,000, $120,000. Got a call from my friend, who is a, a bankruptcy attorney. And this car dealership not doing very well. They're about to bankrupt their, their place. So they need to sell the car. And so he calls me, and he says, hey, this guy, he's going to be liquidated anyways. So for that brand new Mercedes that's not even pink slipped yet, 
80 miles, 80 miles, who wants 20,000 cash? You want it. 20,000 cash. Now, I'm into cars. I already have too many already as it is, so I didn't buy it. It's still available. Anyone interested? You see, hands start coming up. You see, I mean, I, it's, I, I, I'm just, it, there's no car. I, I, I'm just joking, okay? But what I'm trying to say is, what I'm trying to say is that even if I didn't want to buy the car, three or four of you would have. A bunch of you would have today. Does it make sense? When I was in real estate, you know, like I told you last week in class, being good in this business is finding the right angle. You guys understand that? Being good in business is finding the right angle. See, what is the car? The car is just a deal. It's just a deal. In this case, it was a steal. But if you know how to show the client that this property is a steal, then you will sell a home every single day. So do you know what my job when I was in real estate was? Is every single day, I'd wake up in the morning and it became a habit. Every single day, I'd wake up, and the one thing I needed to get accomplished that day is to sell a home by 9 a.m. 9 or 10 a.m., I wanted to have a home sold by 9 or 10 a.m. So every day at 8, I would find the, what I thought was the best deal possible, Robert's deals. And I had a list of these 10, 12, 15 investors that would always be looking for my deals. Once I found the deal I thought was a great deal for the day, I pick up the phone, and chances are I never had to make more than two phone calls before that home was sold. Does that make sense? You see, our job as realtors and as real estate experts is to find the deal. If you find the deal, guess what? You will have unlimited clients because everyone wants a deal. You guys understand that? You guys, you guys understand that? Everyone wants a deal. You see? So, so that's the thing. Is I, for example, that's the thing is, for example, I remember when, come on in, come on in. I remember when I was in real estate, I had two types of customers, okay? One type of customer wanted to buy a lot of properties to hold. So all I had to do is show those types of customers that these homes are free. Okay? Who doesn't want a property that's free? Well, Robert, no, Robert, you're wrong. The properties aren't free. The properties cost money. No, the properties don't cost money if you, if you, if you do the right things with the properties. Okay, I'll give you an example. I have this strip center. Okay, so I want you to understand the angle here. Hey, Mr. Rich Guy, Mr. Doctor, Mr. Lawyer, Mr. Landowner, Mr. Old Man who's 85 years old but has $100 million in his bank, okay? Hey, I have this strip center. This strip center is a 15,000 square foot small retail shopping center and it's selling right now for 100 bucks a foot, okay? Because it's under rented. So you could buy this strip center for $1.5 million. But I wanna tell you something about this strip center. This strip center, even though it's $1.5 million, is under rented for the area. Okay? It's only taking in a dollar a square feet on very short term leases. So I believe that if you buy this strip center, okay, you fix it up, you spend $100,000, $200,000 to fix it up, I believe that we could get you some really big tenants. Matter of fact, I know for a fact that. There's three other tenants in the strip center next door, and they're not happy of where they're at, and they're on short-term leases, that if you fix your place up, I think I can get them to move over. If you get the market rent for that area, this strip center, and the market rent for the areas around two bucks a foot, 
then your strip center, this strip center could easily be worth three and a half to four million dollars. So, Mr. Rich Man, if, you, if your money is sitting in a bank account not doing anything with it, let me help you manage your money and help you find centers like this, i.e. Ethan Conrad, and, and we could turn your $1.7 million investment into $4 million right away in the next year. How would you like that? Well, the rich man, I don't think he'll turn it down. I don't think you'll have to talk to that many rich men to get one rich man to buy it. And you just got yourself a $1.5, $2 million sale. And either you got a management project in which you take a monthly salary, or you have a $4 million listing when it's ready to sell. Or you have an, have an opportunity, an equity opportunity, to say, when you sell, I want 20% of the profit from this transaction because I actually put all those, I put the whole deal together. What angle are you going to go after? Does it make sense? You see, because when I told you that story about the car, guys who have $20,000 in the bank aren't waking up in the morning looking to buy a Mercedes. But if it just so happens that that deal came up and you had $20,000 sitting in your bank, then you know what happens? You're going to get that car sold. Well, believe it or not, there are people, and you don't need to have $1.7 million to buy that strip center. You know what you do is you already have the financing in place. You already have the bank that's willing to lend on that strip center at an 80% LTV. So someone if with $300,000 to come in and buy that strip center. It already has income. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to turn that little strip center that's underperforming into a performing one, i.e. Ethan Conrad, who has billions of dollars in real estate in Sacramento. Does it make sense? You see, so the thing is that I'm going to tell you, if you want to make money in this business, you see, some of you are expert at showing property. You can't be an expert at showing property. What kind of skill you need to have to drive in a car, get a map, and show property? There's no skill in that. Okay? There's no skill in even writing up an offer where it says name, write name. Where it says address, write address. There's no skill in that. The skill in what we do for realtors is the skill in finding the client. It's the skill in making them feel comfortable enough for them to choose you. That's the skill. Well, in real estate, you being a good guy is not a skill. You being handsome, you being pretty, you looking professional, that's not your skill. Okay? Your skill is the ability to analyze the deal and present a steal and a great deal to somebody. Does it make sense? And then you win the client for commercial real estate. Does it make sense? Then you win the client. You see? So, I mean, of course, we have our brand. You know, with Berkshire Hathaway, they're not going to turn you down. We're the world's, we're one of the world's largest brands. Okay? We're one of the world's largest brands. So, Junior, when people come in, just sort of like just help them help them find their seat, okay? All right. So with Berkshire, you're not going to worry about you know, hey, we don't, we've never heard of you before. In the commercial world, Berkshire Hathaway is king of the world. You know, okay, so, so you don't have to worry about anything there. But you have to be able to put the deal together. So, I'll give you an example. How do you find this deal? One of the most important aspects of this business in commercial real estate is to know how to analyze what a steal is. Does that make sense? is to be able to analyze what's a steal, okay? So more so than any other types of real estate, you need to know how, you need to know what inventory is like and know how to analyze the inventory, okay? So I'm gonna go to one of my slides here, is how do we get commercial clients? And like I said, the answer is easy. The answer is easy, you can find commercial clients if you know how to truly break down numbers. Good thing I was always very good at numbers. 
Okay? I was always very good at numbers. Like for example, on the residential side. So so that you're converting your commercial your residential brain into a commercial brain. How do you tell an investor? Okay? How how will we tell an investor that this home is free? No, the home is free. If you compare the price from one home to another, the home's still not free. Okay? Based on income. Because when I used to work with investors, how I sold my homes is I had investors that I put into systems where each one of them would buy at least minimum one, one a month from me. Okay? Because the homes, especially the buying flippers, the homes are free. And then we're going to convert that to commercial. Look, $150,000 rental, the mortgage on a 5% interest rate, the mortgage payment is like $700. That's P-I-T-I. Okay? All right? That's P-I-T-I, $700. Okay? Utilities and garbage is not 100 bucks. All right? $850. Rent on that is $1,700 minimum. So you're paying 800, you're getting uh, 800 back. 800 of that is cash flow, 800 of that is mortgage. You buy at 150, you get the tenant in there, you get the property, what we call performing. The property's performing. When you bought the home, you bought it with 20% down as an investment property. 150,000 is 30,000 out of your pocket. Once it's purchased and it's performing, you wait six months, you get it, you, you start showing income on it. Then, by that time, you know, we're in a market where there's appreciation, I can get someone, you, it's nicer, it's performing, it's getting income. You go in there, you get it, and, and you know, because you know, you have to wait six months to get it reappraised, and you might be able to can't take your cash back out of that property. So, yeah, you're on a seven, six, seven month cycle on that one property, but you put $30,000 into it, you get it performing, you maybe do a little bit of work to it, it's bringing in $1,700 a month in rent, you're paying out $800 a month in cost, you're making around eight, dollars $900 a month in cash flow, but since you have that extra $900 in cash flow, you might as well refinance your money back out, and voila, you have your $30,000 seven, eight months from now back in your bank, you have this property, that instead of paying $800 a month, because you refinanced your $30,000 back out, you're paying $900 a month, even $1,000 a month. So, so what is the end result after eight or nine months? You have a property that you have none of your actual cash put into the property. The property happened to be needed in your name, and you made $700 a month cash flow from it. So you have zero of your money, but you're on title. You get $700 a month, every single month for income. On top of that, if the property doubles in value in five or 10 years, you made all that appreciation. And the tenant's paying your property off. And your tenant every month is paying your property off. What, what, what if you had 100 of those properties? You see, the way you explain something gets people on board to become investors. Does it make sense? Well, guess what? That's a very small game, the little knick-knack <laughs> you know, rentals here and there. In commercial real estate, you want to find that investor that buys a shopping center from you every year. Why don't you do that? Why don't you buy, find that one multimillionaire that not only has you buying for them one or two or three shopping centers every single year, but then at the same time, you manage all of his shopping centers, you do all the leases for all of his shopping centers, okay? For the rest of your life, how do, why, isn't that a good, isn't that a good opportunity to work with an investor like that? Yes or no? <clears throat> That's what people do in commercial real estate. People are being born every day. Investors are being born every day. Millionaires are being born every day. It's just your job is to know what a good deal is and bring the deal to them. Don't not know what a good deal is and try to get them to work with you before you even know what a good deal is. Does it make sense? 
You guys understand that? So anytime you think, how do I get deals in real estate, Robert? It's easy. You find the deal and you bring it to people. You guys understand that? Bring someone a good deal. You say, hey, Robert, well, 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 who, who, if I have a good deal, who do we bring it to? Easy, you bring it to accountants. I don't know if you know that accountants are normally people that work with money. Do you know that? Did you know that accountants are people that normally work with money? That's what they call accountants. And these accountants are normally the people that help their clients hide money. Or that they help their clients put money into the right places. And accountants are normally the people that know when they have their millionaire clients that need to spend a lot of money. Because they need to find as many tax shelters as possible. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You tell me a client that don't know a hundred millionaires that need to put money in different places. You guys understand that? Okay. So you got to have, if you are in commercial real estate or in this business, see, it's funny. One of the things that I, I always train in my classes is that, is that 99% of people have no clue how to do this business. People, a lot of people know that I know what I'm doing, okay? Because I've been doing it for so many years. You know, I have agents that have been working for me for 20 years, 30, 25 years. You guys know that, right? Yes? You guys know that? Okay? And and so, I, Josie, you've been with me since what? 1990 what? 1999. She's been my agent of mine for, since 1999. It's 2019. 20, one of my 20-year agents. So I've been in this business for a long time. And before I was a broker, I was one of the nation's top producers. So, so I've been in it, okay? I've been in it. And, and what people don't understand about this business is that this is a business. If you don't have B2B relationships when you're in this business, you're in the wrong business. What's a B2B re relationship? It's, it's you working with other businesses. When you're in commercial real estate, one of your best friends is you need to know a lot of accountants, okay? Because accountants work with the top clients. So imagine you, oh man, there's this new office building, and this office building is going up for sale for cheap, okay? Uh, this big REIT right now who owns 35 office buildings and commercial properties in Sacramento, they're about to liquidate because they're having financial difficulties in another state. They're going to liquidate their properties. The moment you hear about that, you, you pull up a list of all the properties they own, break down all the numbers for every property, turn every property into a deal, and start picking up the phones to your accountants, your CPAs, and of course, hopefully one day you'll have all these clients say, hey, hey, this big company is liquidating. Well, let's pick up three or four of these buildings here. Does that make sense? And you already have the numbers broken down. Hey, this building is an 85,000 square foot office building. I think they're going to sell it for 120 bucks a foot. The whole area is really selling at 200 bucks a foot. They're selling it for 60 cents on the dollar. Hey, let's go take a look at it. And you don't put down the phone for a week if you don't have to until you have one person or five people interested. And you have offers into these people. Does it make sense? You see? Because why? This office building could be a $20 million office building. Your commission on this office building, it could be it could be what? It could be six, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars. <throat> why wouldn't you work hard for that one office building sale? Does it make sense? I bet you Bill Palmer, he's doing that. The guy remember I showed you last week with all those deals? You think by accident he ended up having all those people as clients? No. He got the deal and he went directly to them. You see? Does it make sense? He got the deal and he went directly to them. Look, people making money, they don't discriminate. Okay? If you have a heck of a deal that you found and you brought it to someone, they're more than happy to entertain 
Does it make sense? Matter of fact, you could be the person specializing in finding great deals on the open market in Sacramento and taking it to all the Bay Area rich people to buy here in Sacramento. What if you did that? You guys understand? Is that when you're in this business, you're doing it in reverse. You're, 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 you're waiting for a client to tell you, this is what I'm looking for. That's not how you do the deal. You don't wait for a client to tell you, hey, this is what I'm looking for. You find what people should be looking for, and you go to people, and you have as many deals as you want. You should make a habit to try to sell one commercial building a month. If I was in the business, I try. I make a habit to try to find one commercial building sold a day. Okay. If I had the time, does it make sense? All right. See, so that that's how you do it. That's how you do it. So, friends in big places. Who do you need to know? You need to know attorneys, and I'll make you a list of things, people that you need to start knowing first. Okay. This is a small list of people that when you're in this business. It's a small list of people that I want all commercial agents to start getting acclimated to. Okay? All right? Okay? These are the people that when you're in that circle, you're going to end up falling into a lot of transactions. Okay? Okay. Accountants, I already explained to you. These are people that that work with people with money that need to spend money. I don't, I, I don't need to go beyond that, okay? You need to know CPAs. You need to know, you know, uh, appraisers. Only reason why you need to know appraisers is, you know, it's funny and commercial. A lot of times, people who want to sell their buildings, they start looking at, they start talking to appraisers to appraise what their shopping center, they feel their shopping center should be worth. So sometimes you get a little bit of insight on on a, on a, on what properties become available, and if you are uh, going to be selling someone's building, you also really need to know commercial appraisers and the lenders right here and the lenders, so that you can get financing in place before you even put the whole building up for sale. Okay, it's good to know architects and engineers, especially if you get into land development and attorneys. Okay, so these are the people that you need to know that's in your circle, and and I'm, I'm going to give you one key secret in commercial real estate to find clients. Okay, I have a database that I pay for, you know, where I could pull up every commercial property in our region, and I know the name and number of the owner of the building itself. So you name it. I could pull up all the multifamily owners. Remember when we did that? And I could pull it up on a spreadsheet. I could pick a circle around any area in Sacramento. And I could I could say, in this area around Sacramento, these are all the people that own a shopping center. I could I can uh, and on a spreadsheet I could pull it up. And I have a name and phone number and email address of all the owners of everyone who owns uh, anything in here in this region. And then you would take that list and you would simply call and introduce yourself and ask them if they wanted to sell their building. You might have an investor that'd be interested. Do you have an investor? Maybe. But if they're interested in selling for a good price, then the answer is definitely. Who's the investor? Whoever you can pick up the phone and call. Call some CPAs and tell them, hey, I found a smoking good deal on a building. The building's not even up on the market yet. It's a it's a 50 unit apartment complex that the, the person's just getting older. He wants to sell. If you get the right price, you want to sell it for. Boom. You start you find the deal, you put the two people together. That's it. You have you're representing both buyer and seller. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me ask you something. If there's a big apartment complex for sale, who wants to buy it? Who wants to buy it? Well, then specifically, which investor would you go to first? Huh? People who own them. Who who, who wants them? Huh? Oh yeah. 
If someone has a 50 unit apartment complex for sale, then you know who I call first? All the other people that own apartment complexes. You guys understand that? If someone, well, someone has a shopping center for sale, who do, you, who do I call? Other people that own shopping centers. If someone has an office building for sale, a $40 million office building for sale, who do I call? Someone that own, also owns five $40 million office buildings. Especially if it's in the same area. Yeah, because why? People like to tie up their competition. Yeah, because, because I mean, they want economies of scale. Does it make sense? And when they want economies of scale, that's what they want. You guys understand that? Amy, I'm teaching. Okay. All right, so, that, so that's, what, that's what they're looking for. You guys understand that? That's what they're looking for. So, so it's funny because when you know about a building that's for sale, the first people you go to are people that own the neighbors and the people that own the same type of building. Because the people that own, like for example, if, if, you, have, if, you, if you bump into a, a care home facility that's for sale, who do you call? Owners of other care home facilities. They already have the nurses on staff. They already know how the business is run. So boom, they buy it, they take it over, no problem, right? You have someone who has a shopping center. They probably have their property managers already staff. They already know how to look at everything. You call them, oh, hey, I have a shopping center for sale. You own the shopping center next door. You want to buy this one? Of course. Does it make sense? Okay. So, so finding the right clients is not hard. Finding the right client is not hard, okay? Does it make sense? You see? So in commercial, obviously it's slower. Obviously it's slower, but, but you know what? I'll, I'll be honest with you, okay? If you meet someone with money and you told them that I'm a commercial uh, real estate agent for Berkshire Hathaway and, and I'm an expert in commercial real estate, People with money always want to be your friend. Seriously. You are talking with people with money, and you tell them, oh, I'm a residential real estate agent. If you ever need to list your home or buy a home, let me know. Unless they're looking to buy rentals, they're not your friend. You're like one of 50 people that want to work with them, okay? But if you're a commercial real estate agent for Berkshire Hathaway, and you're good at what you do, okay? And you know people with money, they all want to be your friend and take you for golf, and they, they all want to talk to you. They always want to talk to you. They say, hey, you know what? My tenant for one of my buildings uh, is going to be moving out. You know, can you maybe help me get another tenant in? Oh, uh, oh, you're, you're a commercial agent? You know what? I, I need to expand my practice. I want to open up a second location in uh, in Roseville. Can you help me out? Yeah. Would you like to lease one, or would you like to buy a building and build this build it to yourself a suit? I have SBA programs right now where you can put ten percent down and finance all of the equipment to build your own, buy a piece of land or buy an office space and build your own center. Why don't you do that? You know. You know that. You know that every. That, that government programs like the SBA 504C and 7A programs have very special uh, deals for professionals. You know that? For doctors, for, for people who are architects, for lawyers, they have very special rates and deals for people to buy their own buildings, especially, especially in the medical practices. So like if you know a group of doctors and you, and you work with a group of doctors, you could be helping them buy buildings and build facilities for like 10% down. And, and that's 10% total project cost. They'll finance the equipment, they'll finance the tenant improvement, they'll finance the purchase of the buildings, 10%. Does that make sense? So those are, and then so who do, you, who do you get to know? You get to know the senior doctors at the hospital. You, 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 you get to know doctors who are leasing for medical office buildings. How do you find doctors in medical office buildings? You just pick your butt there and you walk right in and say, hey, I'm a commercial agent. You know, you're leasing the space out. You're paying this much for the medical office building. A medical office building leasing is expensive. They should just go buy their own building, buy their own pad and expand. Does it make sense? There's lots of angles for that. There's commercial agents that all they deal with 
are medical groups, or like 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 you know like medical associations, and they help these people buy buy pharmacies, buy little prac buildings or practices, and they open up their own building. Does that make sense? That's it. Okay. So so and, and it's very little down payment. Government helps with that, and their interest rates are so good. Good interest rates, long term fixed rates. You know, very little money down. You can't sell that to a doctor. You can't sell that to a doctor that's stuck in a medical <laughs> office building, leasing out 5,000 square foot of space, where they could actually buy their own building and, and own the building themselves and pay half, pay less. Why wouldn't they want to do that? And they could buy a building that's oversized and have tenants too. As long as they occupy at least 51% of the building, then SBA works for them. Matter of fact, we had an agent that represents a bunch of uh, these pizza places. You know, I mean, like for example, you know, like he was working with the Pizza Hut that was leasing a space in a in a in a shopping center. He was able, and then the guy who was leasing the space was paying three bucks a foot. Retail is around two to three dollars a foot, and this is in the Bay Area, so I think retail is like four bucks a foot. Okay, and he was leasing like three thousand square foot for a Pizza Hut. So he showed the guy this five million dollar building. This four four million dollar building, and the building itself was like six thousand square feet. He was able to buy the six thousand square foot building. He took more than fifty one percent of the building, so at a very little out of pocket cost, like three four hundred thousand dollars, he was able to he was able to buy the building, okay, and now his mortgage payment. That he what he was paying for his previous space is less than he's paying less now than what he was paying for his previous space. His spot is a pad that has more visibility. That's right on the corner of a street. On top of that, he now has two tenants. So his two tenants rent more than pays his his mortgage, and his mortgage is free. Okay, and he owns the building. Does that make sense? And we made money on the sale and the loan. Does that make sense? Was that the franchisee that did that deal? What? Yeah, they approved it. You know, I mean, Denny's right here is a franchise. I mean, all these people, they 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 own them. They own them. You see? So so that's the thing is is, is that is that there's so many angles in this business. It's just you got to understand the angle. Does it make sense? Yes or no? Yeah. So it's who you know, okay? These are the people you need to know, all right? Rezoning specialist, you know, this is this is actually within the profession, okay? So, so I'm gonna move to different industries. So we're gonna talk about the different industries in real estate, all right? And then at, for each of the industries, now last week, one of the things I talked about last week was that a vast majority, over 90% of the experts in commercial, they find a lane. And they, because there's so many billions of dollars to be made in commercial real estate, that you just need to find a lane and become the best at that one lane. Does it make sense? You know, last week, remember I was throwing all these ideas at you? What are some of the ideas that I threw at you last week that you liked? That, what was the lane that, that, that after we after you took class last week, you said, maybe this is what I want to do, or maybe this is what I want to do. Raise your hand if you want to share with me. What's one of the lanes in which you like? Yes, Daniel. Like the development. Uh, uh, development. Okay. So that was the lane. So tell me, what's development to you? From one, like one class that you learned last week, what would be the development aspect you learned? Okay, what is that? Multifamily. So, so how would you get into that lane? Well, what do you need to do to get into that lane? <laughs> okay. Well, this course won't teach you how to be in that lane. This course does not specifically, you know, uh, I, I mean, this course would be great. You'll get an idea. But for example, your lane, 
would be you would find the projects that are suitable for RD20. RD20 is residential 20. That means you can put 20 uh, families on one acre. Okay, RD20 is you know is, is apartment. Okay, so you find the land that's RD20, and then you would see. Remember, we worked on a few RD20s, you know, and and you would see what's available, what can be built on there, and then you would take those projects to people that already own multifamily and see if they want to develop multifamily. So, like last week, you know, like uh, like what's one you you like last week? What's what's something you like? You uh, raise your hand. Get the listings for a gas station. Oh, gas station and the restaurant. Gas stations and restaurants. Franchise, mm -hmm. franchise restaurants and gas stations. They're, now that's a good group. The gas stations, franchise restaurants. You know, uh, gas stations are sort of hard because they deal with a lot of environmentals. You know, gas stations are hard because you deal with a lot of franchises. You know, a lot of the big franchises, the A, the BP, the the. And but if you're very good and you get into with all the franchises, there's lots of deals you can be had. Okay. I have a question. Are we gonna cover also the franchise contribution to the well, you're just gonna have to call them. A lot of the franchises already have their relationships, okay? But but in new developing areas, you know, like for example, in new developing areas, sometimes those franchises are still open. But it's good to hit up the new franchises. You know, there's new franchises popping up all the time. And if you want to work with franchises, every year there's the RCSC conference, the retail, the retail conference. And a lot of times they have them in Monterey. You just go to the conference itself. Are they not still at the water? Yeah. I mean, yeah, when we get to retail, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Okay. You know, a, a class that covers every aspect in depth of, uh, in detail for of every industry will literally take you 10 years to complete. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, I mean, because you literally, it takes you years sometimes to be very good at one thing. Does that make sense? We're an industry where you can make millions. If it takes you a, a eight weeks to get good at everything, then, then everyone would do it. And then it's no longer a very ten, you know, uh, uh, a very uh, profitable industry, okay? So let's talk about the different industries of real estate, okay? Different industries, okay, one of the first industries is the office industry, okay, is the office industry. I put them all up right away, so if, uh, if you needed to take a picture of it or you need to write it down, then it'd be good for you to have it in there, okay? But the first industry uh, in real estate that people work in is the office industry, offices, okay? The things that people need in office is different than the things that people need in retail and industrial. Does it make sense? Okay. All right. You know, just retail, office, all of them make great money. For example, we, we're, we're, we deal a lot with government here in Sacramento. You know, office is very big here in Sacramento. You know, office. Now, the difference between office and retail is retail, it, it's a type of business where people walk right up to your door. Office is when people make an appointment to come to you. Does that make sense? Okay. These are the things that office clients need, okay, to understand office, okay? One of the things that, you know, it's not as important as retail, it's not as important as retail, but it, it, visibility is important, or, or, or uh, convenience to amenities is important for offices. If you ever work with office type clients, these are the things that the clients will be looking for. Okay? All right? So, who are, who are the office type clients that one day you'll work with? You might have an attorney that wants to rent an office space. You might have a real estate company like ours that wants to rent an office space. Insurance, Insurance company rents office spaces. Government. Government, of course, rents office spaces. Counties, County, states rent office spaces. You know, all businesses. You know, I mean, businesses need offices. Okay, 
So when looking for an office for a business, you know, you want an office that has visibility. Now, now an office, an office, like, you know, like, believe it or not, like Google headquarters is an office building. Yahoo headquarters is an office building, right? Apple headquarters is an office building, but then they, Apple has retail spaces. The retail spaces are the Apple stores is retail, right? The Apple stores retail, the Apple corporate is office. Apple manufacturing is actually industrial. Make sense? The shipping plant is industrial, okay? See, industrial deals with things that are different than office. Like one of the big things that industrial deals with is electricity capacity. Why? Why, why do you think industrial deals with electricity capacity, amperage? Why do you think it deals with that? Because they use so much heavy machinery. Sometimes they, they you know, like let's say you have a, 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 a place that does manufacturing, all their machines are running constantly you know, high voltage. Does it make sense? So when you go into an office build, so you, you're trying to find someone, you have a user that uses that much amperage, you can't go into an office building. Office building only has so much electricity capacity. It's meant for computers, it's not meant for machines. So that's when you need industrial. Like a, a lot of people, when they rent industrial, they don't necessarily rent per square feet, they rent per cubic square feet. Why? Because some industrial are like mini storages, where they actually build up. Does it make sense? And they need to pack high. Does it make sense? So th they're not looking for square feet, they're working for cube feet. Oh, now you're getting into a different realm, you know? Right? So it's very important that if you choose an industry to be in, that's the industry. Like for example, if you work with primary doctors, they don't go into retail spaces that much. So don't get me wrong, there are dental clinics and stuff like that that are in retail spaces, but normally most of them are in, in medical office buildings. Does that make sense? Okay, they're different. And they all sort of like to be close to each other. So if, if you're a dentist, you could just send the person down, down the hall to the orthodontist, you know what I'm saying? So that they have these uh, medical units, okay? So these are what offices need. So let's talk about offices and we'll go to each of the industries, okay? I'm gonna go sort of fast because, because there's so much to cover. We have a co-star day. We have a day we cover all the co-star and all the MLSs. We have a day where we do all the LOIs. We have a day where I teach you how to do all the offers, you know, and so forth. So, so we only have eight weeks for this. I'm gonna go through this pretty fast. But offices, they, they want visibility, but it's not as important as convenience. Convenience for the people that work in the offices, because the offices, you have a lot more people per square footage, you know? Like in, in an office building, a 3,000 square foot office building, you might have 15, 20 people. In a 3,000 square foot shop, you know, like a retail store, you might only have two employees. You know what I'm saying? So office buildings need convenience, the amenities, need a lot of restaurants for people to go to. Public transportation is important. If, uh, if if people have to get there by public transit, by train or by bus, especially when you're in the city, you know, when you're when you're in San Francisco, public transportation to your office is very important. Okay, compatible businesses. That's why we have medical office buildings. Does it make sense? That's the word compatible business. You'll be looking like a fool if you are working with a. Uh, you'll be looking like a fool if you're in office where you're working with, let's say, a. A investment firm and you try to put them in a medical office building and you try to explain to them that okay you're an investment firm we're, I'm gonna put you in a medical office building because there's so many doctors here that might need your services maybe that's an angle but you're gonna be paying like triple the rent you know, it's like, yeah, so so I don't think that works you know <laughs> you know you have sick people walking by your door or whatever all the time you know? you know so I don't know you know so but but uh, it's compatibility, easy access, easy access to the building, easy access to uh, parking. Office buildings, they like proximity to the airport, okay? Because maybe they have executives flying in and out. They have clients that fly in and out. It's easy to get their clients to and from the airport, okay? So that, that's important. Office buildings need a pleasant setting, a nice area, entry, okay? Office buildings, uh, you know, sometimes the tax jurisdiction is very strong for office buildings. Like for example, we lost a lot of office users. You know what, man, Sacramento, for a while there, man, 
our, our, our county, the people that ran our, our city, you know, wasn't very smart. We had the potential in Sacramento to be the next Silicon Valley. We were already full, like Highway 50 was already set up to be Silicon Alley. What happened? It never came about. Even though Intel is over there, HP is over there, you know, what happened? We were supposed to be the next Silicon Valley. What do you think happened? No, well, we didn't do anything bad. What happened? Competition. Huh? When when living expenses is five times more in the Bay Area than it is here. When real estate is four or five times more than it is here. Why isn't the big Bay Area companies moving here? When it was be so much cheaper. That was that was the angle. That, that, that was supposed to be the case. Right. You know why? Government stopped it from coming. Wow. The government at the time feared that if you let all the Silicon Valley tech companies come here, they would raise the income levels for all the employees here. And the government would lose all their best employees. And, and the government wouldn't be able to afford to have competitive pricing. Does that make sense? Right? Because the tech companies pay so much that if all these new companies were here, then, then paying these types of salaries, then, then, then the demand for real estate obviously will shoot sky high. Right? And if the demand for real estate will shoot sky high and our real estate will cost double and triple, then the government, no doubt, has to pay all their government workers more because how can they afford to live? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Typically in areas where there's a lot of government, income levels aren't super high. Does that make sense? And housing is still affordable. If all the companies like Apple and Google and Amazon move their corporate headquarters here, I mean, I mean we are California. It's, uh, California is a pretty prestigious state to live in. People want to move to California, okay? We are Sacramento, even though we're not, you know, uh, you know, an ocean town. We're only an hour and a half from, from, from beach, and we're only an hour away from snow, right? You know, I mean, we, we, we drive north. We, we drive, you know, in the northeast, and we, we get the Tahoe. We, we're now we're skiing at Heavenly and Squaw, Olympic caliber, uh, you know, snow resorts. You know, we, we go an hour and a half, two hours west of us. We're in Half Moon Bay. We we snorkeling and we're and we're, we're we're scuba diving and we're 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 surfing. You know what I'm saying, right? We 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 head we head up to the hills. We're in mountain country. We're hiking, and we're we're uh, and then we're right by the big lake. We have the rivers all by us. We're the river city, so we have all types of water activities. Why wouldn't we be a destination for these tech companies? Well, guess what? Government said, no way. Tech company come in here, bring us 200,000 jobs. We're going to run out of houses. Houses are going to cost triple. And then how are we going to afford to pay all the people that work for government? Make sense? They won't have houses. So no, 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 no. So guess what? where all, a lot of those people went? If not in California, guess where they all went? They went to Arizona. They went to Texas. Colorado. Colorado. Not really Vegas, but um, but but yeah, a lot of tech companies moved out of the state. Actually, everywhere now, really Tennessee. Yeah, they moved out of the state. It's not smart, you know, huh? North Carolina. What? Raleigh, yeah, they started moving into other destinations. It's like, man, you guys. So now, uh, Sacramento now, now the new managers for Sacramento are making a big push for small tech. That's their next big push. Okay, well, we sort of missed that one. We sort of shot ourselves with that one. Because there was a while there, back in 2001, 2002, where Sacramento was supposed to be the next Silicon Alley. They were going to build a Universal Studios here in Sacramento. Okay? But we shut that all down. We shut it all down. 
I know because I work with a lot of developers. I want to develop stuff, and man, this guy's just getting it shot down left and right. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, I wouldn't be a developer here. Yeah, so now they're making, now they want to turn Sacramento into a tourist location. You know, they're putting like a, the, like, like 30, 40, 50 million dollars to the riverfront. I don't know if you guys know about that. When you're commercial real estate, you know, when you're commercial real estate, you're going to find out that you are actually a lot more professional. Mm -hmm. And you know a lot more about what's going on with government, a lot more of what's going on with the developments going on. You know, if you want to learn a higher level of real estate and really understand and really set your life, because see, look, one of the things I, I was telling my, my own son who went to class with me today, I said, look, when you get in real estate, because I've been involved in residential real estate my whole life, I'm not going to get him in residential real estate. I'm going to start smack dab and lending and commercial real estate right away. Does that make sense? If it takes you 10 years to get good in real estate, I bet you a lot of you have already put 10 years into this business. You put 10 years in real estate, your commercial real estate, anyone who's 10 years in commercial real estate or longer, they, they all make two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars like it's nothing. Does it make sense? Because what I'm telling you is that you're 10, 15 years invested in commercial real estate, you're closing at least four or five transactions a year that make you over a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a piece. You, you see what I'm saying? So it's, it's like, it's like, it's like it's like you telling your kids when they got out of school. It's like it's like it's like it's like you telling your kid, "Hey, spend that extra two years in college and become a doctor." Why stop at becoming a a you know whatever uh, uh, a therapist? You know why stop at becoming a nurse? Why stop at becoming a therapist? You know yeah you know becoming a nurse you make great income. Eighty, hundred thousand dollars a year, but spend that extra two, three years to become a doctor, even a surgeon. Spend that extra two or three years to become a surgeon. Why? It took you an extra two years, but now you're making four hundred thousand dollars a year for the rest of your life. Save the two or three years, and you're making eighty thousand dollars a year for the rest of your life. Does that make sense? So in commercial real estate, it, you are trust me, you're investing more time to close your first deal. You can't just go in there and expect to close a $10 million deal, even though it might happen. So the overseas, when you were a doctor, you were back in the back of the day, you were 42%. So you can yeah. make more money in this market. Yeah, yeah. So commercial real estate is, is good to be in, but you've got to take it seriously. That's all. That makes sense? All right. It's very good to be in, but you just got to take it seriously. Okay? All right. So, anyway, let's move forward. Okay. Uh, strong tenant leases. Is there in here? Turn that phone off. I did it. I don't know. <laughs> there should be a button. You push it over to the side and say vibrate. Every time your phone rings, I'm checking my own phone. You know? <laughs> you know <laughs> There's a little thing, a little switch. You push it on to vibrate. <laughs> okay. Uh, strong tenant leases is very big in commercial offices. Okay, strong tenant leases. Signage is important, somewhat important. Signage is somewhat important. You know, some people want a big building with their sign in front of the building, but they have to pay extra for that. Amenities of the complex, some places have gyms, some places, you know, have boardrooms, okay? Utility, technology, security. Now, and then of course, parking, okay? So let's talk about the different types of offices and we'll talk about them, okay? So. Uh, this stuff is going to be on your exam, so I, if I were you, I, 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 uh, I, I know about this, okay? All right, is there's different types of offices. The, the first type of offices is called a cottage style or single tenant. Okay, these are normally standalones, okay? These are normally for, you know, a, a lot of the professional services like architects and engineers, they like those standalones. Okay, name me a place in Sacramento that a lot of people know about that have a lot of standalone office spaces. Anyone know of any places that there are a lot of standalone? Well, okay, so a standalone or cottage style office buildings is you'll see a big office complex with just you know like 
three or four thousand square foot buildings sitting by themselves. They all look very similar, identical. You know, you, know, you, you might have gone to one. You know, they'll, they'll call themselves, you know, uh, they'll all go by the same address, but one's like Suite A and then, then Suite B and then Suite C and D, right? All right? Those types are pretty attractive to people that, that really don't want neighbors, but they want to be in that office setting, okay? A lot of those buildings, these cottage style standalones, a lot of these are actually, when they're built, they're built to sell. When these are built, they're built to sell. Does that make sense? So they'll sell a 3,000, 4,000 square foot building, and then, and then you just go in there and buy the building. And so if you have, let's say, an architect group, or an engineer, or you have a medical practice, they'll say, I'm looking to buy a, a, a suite. Well, I mean, it's easier to buy one of these, because these have your own electric meter, OK? These, you, you have your own parking that's reserved for you, OK? So you have an owner user that wants to buy, you know, this is really good. Medical, radiology, you know, dentistry, orthodontics, you know, these are perfect for people to buy. Does it make sense? And and so and so when you if you're working in office and you have those types of clients, you want to work with those clients that get those SBA loans, see check this out. Check this out. You have a doctor client that needs three thousand square foot, four thousand square foot for their space. This is exactly the type of building you're looking for. And they could buy a 3,000 square foot space and occupy the whole thing. They could buy a 7,000 square foot space and occupy half, rent the other half out, and still only need to put 10% down on SBA financing. Does it make sense? Yes or no? Yeah. Perfect. Same client can't go into an office building. Does that make sense? Because the office building, they have to occupy 51% of the whole <laughs> building. They, they can't get SBA financing. Does that make sense? Okay. So these are perfect for that. All right. Now, one of the things that we deal with in office is we deal with uh, one of the most important things we deal with offices is parking ratios. Our parking ratios. What's that? Tell me, tell me what parking ratios are. The number of parking spaces per thousand square feet. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why does office have to deal with that? Because the business is they need to have they need to know how many uh, of their clients can fit in that area. Yeah. Does parking ratio you have to have more parking ratio for office than retail or less parking ratio? Yes. No, you have to have more. Yeah. The reason why because retail people, they come and they go. Office, they come and they stay for nine hours. Do you guys understand that? Right? In office, like let's say you have a call center as your office space. When they come, they come and they sit their butt down, they stay for the whole day. So when you have an office, your office ratio has to be higher because People in office, they come and they stay. They don't go anywhere. Retail, look at a 7-Eleven. How many people go in through a 7-Eleven door every single hour? Hundreds. They have three spaces in the front of the 7-Eleven. You understand? There are four spaces in front of a 7-Eleven. Hundreds of people go in and out, the park, get gas, walk in, walk out, in and out all day long. They have four spaces. Can you imagine 100 people with four spaces in an office? No. You understand that? So office, people come, they stay. Retail, people come in and out all the time. You understand that? If you don't know this stuff about office, you're going to seem silly. When you start doing office, they say, what's the parking ratio? What? Does that make sense? Parking ratio for medical different than parking ratio for other uses. Let's say for example, I, I have a friend who I'm helping and, and they want to open up an indoor, they want to open up an indoor playground facility for kids. You know, like you know like it's a birth, birthday party type of venue. You know what I'm saying? 
where they have birthday parties and kids come and they have a lot of sensory play. So, so they have areas where they get to build things, there's areas where they get to climb on things, there's areas where they get to paint on things, whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? But you know that most centers, most of the centers, the CCNR don't allow for that use. Most of the centers, the CCNR don't allow for that use. You know what I'm saying? So finding a place that allows for that use is different. Does that make sense? So the, now we get into the world of, of, of commercial. You know, now we're starting to deal with that kind of stuff, okay? So so those are the college, those are the cottage single tenant. So if you were in office and you wanted to have an angle, say, hey, I'm gonna work with a lot of doctors, I'm gonna work with a lot of engineers, I'm gonna work with a lot of people to get out of college, they spend their first three or four years making a name for themselves, and I'm gonna help these people expand their businesses and own their own building. That's a great avenue, right? A normal building like this, built out for medical practice, is minimum three, four million dollars. A three percent commission on four million dollars is $120,000. What if you had one of these pop every month? You know, what if you have one of these popping every month? How many $120,000 commissions do you need to make in one year to be comfortable? How many? One. one. <laughs> but see, but commercial people, man, do you know how much work it is to work with a client, to help them find a building to buy, and, and have them go through that process? You know how much work is involved? About less work than one of your real, real estate sales. Less work than one of your real estate sales. Huh? Man, our agent closed a two hundred fifty thousand dollar commission. Never met the client. I took the client out to dinner. We never even seen the client. Bought the building cash, sight unseen. How many disclosures do you think we have in resident in commercial real estate? Five. Around none. <laughs> it's a buyer beware industry, you know. It, it's seller tell you what you know. You know nothing. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's it. Residential, you have a stack like this. Commercial, you have the contract. That's about all we got. I mean, yeah, they did their environmental study, but. But it's them doing it themselves. I didn't even see the environmental on it. The guy bought a building, I didn't even see the environmental. Does it make sense? First time home buyers, how sophisticated are they? Not. People that buy buildings, they're more sophisticated than you. Okay? <laughs> All right? Sometimes you don't work with them, you work with their CPA. Oh, my CPA is gonna send you the package. Okay, great. Get the, C get the package, forward it. You, put, you know how to push a forward button to the lender? Forward it. Done. That's it. Okay. Man, I have so many deals in commercial where I never even met the people. Didn't even go look the property more than once. They went to their signing themselves. That's it. Done. Commission come in. It's about it's about it all. It's like it's not. It, it, it is hard, but it's easy at the same time. It's funny how commercial real estate is that way. You know what I'm saying? It's hard, but it's easy. It, it, it's hard because there's a lot of things you have to know. But easy because you don't, there's not a lot of work. Does that make sense? And it's crazy because commissions are so big. Okay? So, and there's no such thing as red fin and uh, purple bricks trying to charge you, you know, 500 bucks. You know, that industry is untouched. You know what I'm saying? Commercial industry is, is not like that. So you don't have to worry about commission cutting or anything like that. Does it make sense? You don't have to deal with any kind of that. There's nothing like that. You guys understand? Okay, so so because of that, this industry is, is, is a good industry. But but getting into the industry, if you're with CB Richard Ellis, good luck. Good luck. Everything is picking. You, you, you might spend five, ten years and not even get to do one deal. Same thing with all the other companies. Over here, you guys are lucky. We're, we're letting you get with the number one of the top, the number one real estate brand in the world. You know what I'm saying? So there's an opportunity there. Like I said, one small single tenant cottage office and a commission is a hundred thousand dollars 
and you only need to do one a year to be somewhat comfortable. Don't go into it doing one a year. Go, go into it doing five a year. Can you imagine for the whole entire year, you work with five doctors or five clients, each buying one building from you and you help them with the SBA loan? And, and we ended up doing it for that. And you made 500000 a year doing that. Not bad, right? What if you did that for the rest of your life? What if these doctors are so happy with you that every few years they get another building and they start expanding their practices? You see? That's commercial for you. You guys get it? And that's only single tenant. Now, small suburban offices. Okay? So you would understand what's a the, what the small suburban office is. Okay, a small suburban office would be, maybe this building would be considered a small suburban office. Uh, it's one, two-story buildings, you know, like, like a Regis Center is normally in a small suburban building. Okay, you know, the buildings are normally 20,000, 10 to 40,000 square feet. You know, they're not like the big, like for example, a, a, a high-rise is what you see downtown at the Wells Fargo building, you know, that the 40-story building, that's a high-rise. What if you sold a high-rise one day? Do you know that I've seen a contract for the purchase of a high-rise before? You know how long the contract on a purchase of a high-rise building is? Huh? It's, it's about the same as your contract to sell your mobile home, okay? I mean, how many possible words can you put on there? There's only one line that says sales price is the same. I've seen a contract for a $300 million high rise, and the contract was five pages, six pages long. The whole packet was, you know, not big, big a deal. What, what the, the, the most, uh, the thickest thing about that packet was, was uh, all the leases. What, all the leases. It's not just California rates. What? Your license. For commercial. Our license is in California. Yeah, but for, for real, for, for commercial, is it just in the different states? No. It's, it's, it's here. It's in California. And then the commission, is it taxable? Is it uh, the annual commission paid to be paid with, with commission? What is it? Is no, it the bigger deal, the commission is only 1%. Yeah, $300 million deal, the the commission is actually it varies, but it's normally one to three percent, but but more likely one or two percent. Okay, yeah, on deals where on deals where it, it gets into like the 20, 30, 40, especially the three hundred million dollar deal, the commission was I, I'm sure only one percent. Okay, but that's three million dollar commission. It's not too bad. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But then I've seen a close to a billion dollar deal pay a ten percent commission. Yeah, yeah. I've seen a billion dollar deal pay a 10% commission. What was that? Casino in Vegas. Was the broker fee different? What? Was the broker fee different on the commercial? What do you mean? Our split? Of course. <laughs> you think I charge a flat fee for that? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Typically, commercial 70 30 is really high. Okay. And that's what we normally sell. Okay. Um, uh, so one or two story buildings, and then if you're going to do commercial, we add an addendum to your contract. Because when we do that, then we let our e &O carrier know that, that you're going to be handling that type of transaction, okay? We don't, there's no way on a commercial deal there's any kind of flat fee or anything like that. It'd be crazy. Why would we even do that? You know? <laughs> I would hand you your prices back and say, go to CB Richard L. See, see, yeah. see <laughs> good luck. <laughs> you know, good luck. You know? Good luck. You know why I know it's hard? Because when I was a broker a long time ago, and I was one of the top producers in the whole country, I asked them if I could start with them to, to do commercial real estate, and, and they wanted me to put me on a five-year program where I would start as a to start like a mail carrier. I said, like, what are you kidding? You know, I have 200 agents that work for me. I said, no, no. No, I mean, it's hard to get into the door. Because why? Because Chris Campbell, John Schultz, all those guys already, they, they already have all their market already. Good luck breaking into that. No way. No way. These guys are going to make $20 million a year and want to give up their spot in line. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, look, listen, guys. Those guys don't make a million a year. Those guys make more than NBA players. 
Okay, I'm just telling you. You know, when you play the game at a high level, it's a whole different ball game. Does it make sense? It's a whole different ball game. Okay. Okay. All right. Small suburban offices. Uh, one or two story buildings or multiple tenants. I'm sure you guys can picture. Like for example, over here in Laguna, there's a bunch of these type of buildings. You guys see that, right? A title company will have one spot. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Okay, a title company, another real estate company, uh, you know, Cobalt Banker or Keller, they're in those buildings, you know what I'm saying? You know, so those are the type of buildings. They don't have a standalone big center like us, but, but they have, they're in a small suburban office style location, okay? So, so, so when you have a type of client that wants that, say, like, yeah, you know, I'll take you to a small suburban office, you know, a small suburban office building, okay? Next stage of office building, mid-rise or office park. Mid-rise. Mid-rise would be like, mid-rise like one of those five-story, you know, like, like, you know, the government occupies it. If you go down on Broadway or you go downtown, you see some mid-rises. You guys understand what I'm talking about? There's a mid-rise building that might be a, like a, a, a big government user or um, the mid-rises are, are similar to the low-rise or the or suburban areas, except they're just bigger. They're normally mid rises, or normally, you know, like maybe a Sutter Medical Group, like a hospital, a Kaiser, would be considered like a mid rise, but even though that's actually a hospital, okay? Mid rise. And then high rise, according to BOMA, okay, uh, is 25 stories and above, okay? What's that? Actually, I, I forgot the actual word for it, uh, so you guys would look it up. Okay. Like the, the business office management association, something like that. I forgot what it was. It's long, been so long since I've been in office. So 25 stories above. Normally, large companies come in there and lease full stories. Like, like office buildings will come in and literally take out floors. You know, unfortunately, like for example, like uh, you know what happened in 9/11. You know, when, when the buildings collapsed, talk about whole companies went out of business. Whole companies got destroyed. I mean, because, you know, they, they would lease out, like, you know, and normally the companies would want, like, the highest floors. The higher your floor, the more Prestige. prestigious it was. And, and when the planes hit the building, all the floors above, all the people couldn't go down. So whole companies got killed. Full entire companies got killed, you know, but, 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 uh, yeah, but those are high rises where companies would, would, uh, would lease big, large companies would lease floors and floors, you know what I'm saying? Okay. And they are large spaces with anchor tenants and so forth. Okay. There's refusal rights. Um, normally like when you're working with office spaces, you always ask for refusal rights. Uh, uh, does anyone know what refusal rights are? Well, what's that? Well, what is a refusal right? First right of refusal is uh, you can't sell it. You got to let somebody else have the first right. Uh, yeah, that, that's a purchase from first right. First well, right. first rights of refusal will have certain things. Right to purchase if it goes for sale. Like, uh, like if you're a big tenant, sometimes you negotiate in there the right to purchase if the building goes on sale. But more so, an office space is actually not really for purchase. It's if space next to you becomes open, you're given the first right to lease the next space next door. Okay, so more often it, it, it's for space next door. So, so like for example, your medical office, and you leased out three thousand square feet, but but you're expanding, so you always ask for the first right next door to you. So if if any of the tenants next door to you they move out, you have the first right to lease it before they put it up for lease. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So those are the refusal rights, okay? All right, so next, let's go move into retail. Let's move into retail. All right. Oh, okay.
All right, so retail. Let's talk about the different retail property. Oh, it's not allowing me. Okay. All right, so what are retail needs? These are things that retail needs. Okay. So when you're working with people for retail, oops, when you're working for people for retail, retail people look, look, look for things that are a little bit different than people with office spaces, okay? So when you're working with retail customers, you're working with restaurants, you're working with nail salons, hair salons, you're working with, uh, uh, you know, uh, tire repair shops, you're working with, you know, things are quick. Make sense? In and out. Little stores, major stores, okay? So let's talk about retail. Now, so far, talking about offices, raise your hand if so far office is something you might want to work in. Okay, good. Well, some of you will want to work in, like, raise your hand if you ever want to work with the doctors, want to buy buildings and get SBA loans on them. Oh, good. That's a good angle, okay? That, that's one of those things. See, so some people, they want to work in development. Some people want to work in uh, entitlement. Raise your hand. Last week, we, we talked about entitlement. Raise your hand if one, one day you want to work in entitlement. Raise your hand. You know, it's, it's funny. See, I, I mentioned entitlement, and one person raised their hand. Believe it or not, the people that work in entitlements, those are the ones that you become millionaires right away. Believe it or not. Those are the ones where those deals are harder to find. <laughs> But those are the ones where you cash in on one of those, you're a millionaire. You guys understand what I'm talking about? Remember last week I told you? Raise your hand. If you, someone tell me, what is entitlement? Well, what is entitlement? We talked about last week. What is entitlement? Huh? Can say, you have no lot of cash, so you're giving it all this government uh, entitlement or approval, all this government approval. Mm -hmm. Entitlement is taking land, getting land rezoned for a higher use, and taking it to certain points of the development phase and selling the projects off for a profit. That's entitlement. Does that make sense? No, entitlement simply is taking land, working on improving the approved use on the land, and then selling it for a profit. For example, I'll give you an example. There's a project that we have a client in our company looking at right now, right on Bruceville. Okay, there's there's anyone know Bruce, Bruceville and Laguna? Anyone know that area of Bruceville and Laguna? There's a big piece of land that's sort of next to the Outback Steakhouse back there. Okay, there's a quick quack that just built there. There's a little quick quack car wash. It's across from the well-seasoned restaurant, little new dim sum restaurant there. Okay, you guys sort of know where I'm talking about? Well, all back there, you'll see like this 15 acre piece of land with all these stubs popping out of the ground. It's been sitting there vacant for the last six, seven years. Okay, like right, all the land behind the quick quack car wash right there, okay? And all these stubs, and you see this big square sign saying the word under redevelopment planning. And that's from the county. There's a, there's a sign that says under redevelopment planning. That was planned to be a big shopping center. Okay? It was planned to be a big shopping center. But guess what? The shopping center didn't go through. The people developing developing the shopping center, you know, didn't get all the tenants they needed. They just, they just went out of business, sort of. Okay, the plan went out of business. So the new owner bought it for a good price, and they're having it redeveloped for high-density residential. Does that make sense? They're having it rezoned and reworked for high-density residential right now. Okay? So whoever bought it, probably bought it for a very good price. And because high density residential is very valuable right now, okay, because you know homes are at a shortage, they probably bought it and tripled their price. So so the moment so you can buy a piece of land like that for let's say two million, and then if the city approves the rezone to high density residential, 
you immediately probably have something worth, you know, at least five or six million. So you tripled your money just by the city allowing you to do something else. And if they follow through with it, it could be a home run. Does it make sense? So the ability for you to convince the city, like for example, I'll give you an example. We had a client that owned a farm, okay? The city built a road right on the frontage of their farmland. So we convinced, convinced the city to turn it into commercial. Man, that piece of land went from worth 500,000 to $15 million. Does that make sense? Huh? No, it was a different project. It was on Elk Grove. It's on the, it's the main street, Elk Grove. You know the main, okay, that main street where Costco is on Elk Grove, at one point in time, was that piece of being sold for like a million dollars. I'm just telling you. You know the you know the plot where Costco is right now with all those shops over there in Elk Grove Boulevard? That piece of land was being sold for a million dollars for like five years. No one would buy it because it wasn't zoned correctly. Man, that person that bought it, and you, you know about that piece, right? Yeah. The person that bought it, bought it, man, they ended up reselling for like 10 million to Costco, something like that, crazy number. But Robert, what did they do? There was a nursery on Elbro, mm -hmm. 1.7 million. They, they took the front for commercial, and behind they built, I think, maybe 200 homes. Yeah. They, they I think, was 10 times. They made 10 times profit, it was a nursery. It was a nursery, yeah. you know. And man, they bought it, they tore down the nursery, yeah. turned the whole front into commercial, and built 200 homes in the back. Okay? So just so you guys know, that's entitlements. And believe it or not, learning about entitlement is not hard. But Robert, it's not hard. It's just, it's just a different game. It's a different angle. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, he said you have to have two, three million dollars to play the game. No, you just have to have someone with two, three million dollars. And you play the game with that person. You find the deal, and you share the profit. That's how you do it. You know what I'm saying? See, so those are entitlements. So see, so I'm, I'm, we're talking about different types of commercial, okay? All right, so next is retail. Okay, let's talk about retail. All right, retail, location to their customers. That's important. So retail is very demographic driven, okay? What, what does that mean, demographically driven? Whereas office is not demographically driven because it's your own office. Office is more convenient. Does that make sense? Income allowance. An office is, is, is convenient. It's convenient for people to go to their home so it's, 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 it's close to people's houses. It's close to where people will go buy gas and go buy groceries. It's close to people getting to airport. Does that make sense? Office is more about convenience, okay? Retail is less about convenience, more about demographics. More towards, like for example, in if, if you're representing a retail customer, and let me let me say, let's say one of your retail customers happens to be Starbucks. Are you in? Yeah. You're in. You know, let me let me show you. A, a Starbucks lease, okay, or just a, a Pete's lease or a Jamba Juice lease, these spaces aren't that big. You know, they're maybe 1,200 to 1,500 square feet, okay? But they're at around 350 to four bucks a foot. So they are $6,000 a month leases, okay? Uh, so retail right now for a nice place is around three bucks a foot, all right? Office runs around 150, 175, Retail runs around three to three fifty. Okay. So Robert, sometimes I know one guy in San Francisco. He leads to Starbucks, mm -hmm. and then he he want to get one percent of their profit, whatever the lease is, and one percent of sales profit. Did they agree? Yes. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, he he's from India. He's okay. local too. Okay. So so basically, three fifty a foot or three bucks a foot. 1,500 feet, like five, that's like 5,000 a month. That's, uh, that's uh, over 60 months, so 5,000 uh, over 60 months. But they, they signed 10-year leases. 
So, so, so for for these ten year leases, for these ten year leases, uh, a lease like that is. Let me see how much is this. Three hundred fifty thousand. Five thousand times uh, sometimes uh, ten year, hundred twenty months. Six hundred thousand times three percent, which is consistent. Eighteen thousand commission. You know what I'm saying? So uh, a lease like that, it's like you know, ten twenty thousand dollar commission for leases like that. Okay. So, but retail clients, and, and, and the good thing about retail clients is that if you represent, let's say if you represent uh, one client, a lot of times they expand in more locations, okay? Retail, they just keep opening up more and more places. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So there's a, star, there's a nonprofit organization, which everybody says, well, Starbucks can go in there. But then I saw on the NLS LoopNet that the guy's asking $1.2 million for the, the empty drive through for the what pad? What do you mean? Yeah, lease it or he's going to sell it? Well, he wants 1.2 million, isn't it? Obviously, he wants to sell it, but he'll probably lease it too. <clears throat> he'll lease it. Yeah. As long as he gets the stuff. Yeah, I mean, he'll lease it, he'll sell it. I'm so sure. I mean, you'll just talk to him. Buy property that it gets used for lease. Who? Starbucks. Uh, Starbucks, I think they, they normally lease them. You know, I think they normally lease them. They're not like McDonald's who yeah. always buy. Okay? Yeah. Um, so, so uh, retail is locations of customers. All right. Now, ingress and egress is actually very important for retail customers. What's ingress and egress? You know, one of the very first Starbucks ever seen shut down is the one right across the street. There was a Starbucks right there, and and they they closed their doors not because they went out of business. It's just ingress and egress was too difficult. Okay. So, what's ingress and egress? What's that? How easy is it to get in and how easy is it to get out, right? I mean, people who want something fast don't want to go onto a left turn lane, don't want to have to like, you know, U-turn back around, go somewhere. When they're going, when they're AM traffic going this way to the freeway, they don't want to be going against the, uh, the, the PM side of the road. So let me ask you, what's AM PM traffic then? It's not a convenience store. There's, there's AM traffic and PM traffic. What's AM traffic and PM traffic? Okay, so AM traffic is the direction of traffic that goes headed towards the freeways in the morning. PM traffic is the direction the traffic goes going from the freeway to home. There's a difference between AM traffic and PM traffic. Make sense? So like the, the donut shops, the, the breakfast places, even the gas stations, the convenience stores, all right, the, the breakfast houses, they normally want AM traffic. Okay? The other ones, you know, the other ones, like for services and something like that, then it, PM traffic is fine. So there's AM side of the road and PM side of the road. Okay? And we deal a lot with ingress and egress. Monument signage is, uh, is important, you know, the, the sign you can see from the street, because in retail, in retail, we look at demographics. You know, we did look at things like uh, median household income for the area. What is the AM traffic and PM uh, traffic counts for the day? Does that make sense? What are the traffic counts for the day? You know, uh, um, what is the... Um, uh, what is the uh, the age of the area? Like for example, you build a video game store. I don't think you're building one in Palm Springs, <laughs> where people retire. You know what I'm saying? You know, you're not building a GameStop over there next to the 55 year older uh, you know community there. Does that make sense? Right? But but then but but at the same time, you are building things that cater to that to to more elderly. Does that make sense? So all right. When you, you want to get stuff, uh, statistics like traffic counts and things. It's like all that. in CoStar. Okay, so let me tell you what CoStar does. CoStar is our analytics engine. Okay. LoopNet is is just like an eBay. Individual could go post things on LoopNet, and companies could go post things on LoopNet. And when you post something, you post it. There's no data. Okay, you can't run comps, you can't run studies, you can't run traffic counts, you can't run any of that. Okay? CoStar is the 
mother of all mothers of information. In CoStar, okay, we have all the comparables. We have all the sales history. We have all the leases. We have all the rents in the area. We have all the demographics. We have all the, uh, the traffic counts for certain streets. And we have all that information in CoStar. Does that make sense? So LoopNet is like an eBay. You know, you, anyone and everyone can post things and people can search, but information is not there. Does that make sense? CoStar is where everything is at. And that's what we have a membership to. And there's a day I'm going to be training you guys on CoStar. Okay? It doesn't mean you have to go pay for it every single month. It's just you get to look at it. I'm on CoStar all the time. I, I've, I've logged in Jason, Michael, plenty of times. Let me go in. Are you pretty good at CoStar now? Somewhat? Are you pretty good at CoStar, Jason? Yeah, so 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 I have agents here who've been using CoStar before, you know what I'm saying? Okay, and I, I've used it for for 20 years, so, so I, I've had it for many years, okay? All right, so uh, retail also, uh, is a, a big thing of retail is other tenants, okay? A big thing in retail is retail has to have a lot of... Um, of a uh, of a uh, tenant help, you know, it's a it's a it's a the, that cohesiveness of the tenants are in area. So so one of the things you'll see is that when you see a Jamba Juice, Jamba Juice normally follows Starbucks. So when you see a Starbucks, you see a Jamba Juice. Okay. So so Jamba Juice even says to their broker, Hey, well, there's a Starbucks and there's a space that's available. If we want to take next door, why? Because people that go to Starbucks normally Sometimes the alternate is, is Jamba Juice. Does it make sense? It's the alternate. You don't see any Pete's Coffee sitting right next to Starbucks, do you? No. Yes or no? No. No. Make sense? But you always see, like for example, they sort of follow each other. Starbucks, Jamba Juice, Subway. You see a lot of Subway <laughs> next to them. You know what I'm saying? It's sort of the complimentary. Oh, I'm going to go get a Subway sandwich, which eat healthy somewhat, and I'm gonna walk over to a startup and get, get my fix of, uh, of caffeine. Okay, so so they're 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 complementary. Make sense, right? But then sometimes they're complementary on a big scale. Like for example, you know we talked about last week is these shopping centers. People who are retail always want to follow anchors. So last week, what's an anchor? Name an anchor for me. Huh? McDonald's is not an anchor. They're not big enough to be an anchor. But, uh, but Walmart is an anchor store. Costco is an anchor. Okay? Uh, Home Depot is an anchor. Make sense? Okay, Target is an anchor. Okay? So a lot of times, what we'll be talking about it more here, is, is uh, these, these places, they follow anchors. Does it make sense? So they follow anchors. So... So if you are a, a restaurant, if you're like, you know, like, so a lot of times, like, you'll see a Home Depot or an anchor, and right next to the anchor, you see a second anchor, like a big pet smart, right? Casino is anchor too. Huh? Casino. No. <laughs> okay. So well, in a way, I guess you could say, you know, in a way, if you're in Las Vegas, no, you I guess, I guess, I guess you're an anchor. Casino, you know? Yeah. I'll, t I'll tell you this much, guys. If you are in Elk Grove real estate, you own Elk Grove real estate, when the casino gets here, your property values are going to be looking pretty good. Okay, they're bringing in like a few thousand jobs, okay? You know, bringing in a few thousand jobs. So a business like a Dutch Grove, they are a standalone. They have to be built from scratch. So yeah, they're a standalone. So that would they're be, a pad. That would be entitled uh, under that umbrella? No, 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 no. When you build, uh, when you build a shopping center, you build pad spots. Yeah. Like, you know, like when, when you build a shopping center, you know, when you build a shopping center, you know, uh, it looks like this. But, so, go ahead. But uh, I noticed the Dutch brothers are... Um, they're small. But they're leasing from parking lots that have already been there. No, they, they, they just have a different model. I mean, if they, if they could build their spot, like, you know, they, let's say this is a shopping center. And if you're talking about one of those super regional centers, you'll they'll build out like you know like like three anchor spots, and then they'll build out a bunch of you know cutouts. You know what I'm saying? Okay. 
they'll cut out. And then they, maybe they'll have a bunch more cutouts right here. You know what I'm saying? And then everyone will share, you know, the, the you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the parking lot. You know what I'm saying? Everybody, everyone will share, you know, the, the parking lots right here. And then if this is the street right here, then they'll build out some pads. You know what I'm saying? They'll build out some pads. So when they put a plan like that together, say, hey, we have three anchors. So, you know, let's say, you know, like Walmart <laughs> comes in, you know, Home Depot comes in, and let's say uh, PetSmart comes in, and then you'll, you'll have like, you know, maybe like the food area right here, or the food area on one side right there, and you'll have like the other services here, nail salon, and then, you know, there'll be pads. This could be a Mickey D pad, McDonald's pad, and then they'll have a, then they'll maybe they'll, they'll throw in there some kind of Taco pad, like Taco Bell, right? Then they'll throw in like a, uh, like a Chick-fil-A, and then whatever, you know, so those are pads, okay? So when you're in this business, now you get to understand, oh, okay, Robert, I'm, I'm finally getting it. That's cool, I'm finally getting it, you know what I'm saying? Okay? So you, you see what I'm saying? So the big spots are anchors, okay? Sometimes the anchor, but these time, these days, you know, they, uh, but the, the, you know, they're anchors, there's normal, there's normal spots. So like, for example, you know, like you'll call one of the centers. So like, hey, I have someone who, uh, I have a restaurant. You just call the, the manager, the broker on that spot. And I get like, Benny, what, what, what's the deal that you're doing with them? The one that I helped you with yesterday or today? What is it with John? Yeah. It's furniture, right? Yeah. But is that standalone or is it in the center? See, so he, he's doing 8,000 square foot furniture. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's on a standalone, but these aren't standalone. These are attached. So you just call the broker and say, hey, I have a client looking for unit A right here. And, and you know, what, what are you leasing it for? And then, you know, and then he'll, he'll, he'll value. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so that's how it works. We, we have one missing right here. Yeah. Oh, okay, wait, wait. Did I, did I get everything? Okay. So, okay, so competition. <clears throat> some is good, too much is bad. Like, for example, like, like normally there's some businesses that only want one up. There's some shopping centers where they'll allow for, for really for one, for one hair salon, you know, one nail. You know, there's some places where they allow for one of something. And then there's some places where they want a lot of something, like a food court. Does that make sense? But they'll in that food court, they'll only want one Chinese vendor. They'll want one sandwich vendor. They'll they'll want one cupcake vendor, one you know yogurt vendor. So they won't they won't let you know. So normally they won't have a Chick Fil A. I mean they won't have a McDonald's and Burger King right next to each other. They 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 won't do that. Okay. Normally they won't. They won't uh, put a Starbucks and Pete's right next to each other. They, you know what I'm saying? They won't put a Togo's and Subway right next to each other. They, they just don't do that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you see a food court, you say, hey, I, I have uh, uh, my client, she's a restaurant user. They'll ask exactly, well, give me your business plan and what type of restaurant are they? Oh, they're a boba place. Okay, well, we already have a boba. We already have a multi cup here. We're not going to let you have another boba. Sorry. You know what I'm saying? So they'll, 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 so some competition is good, too much is bad. They're not going to have a Pet Smart and a Petco right next to each other. No way. You see what I'm saying? It's going to kill both of them, and then they're going to have two empty spots. You see? But when you write up the lease, you always also write up uh, an exclusivity. So when we write it up, like remember the lease that LOI was helping you with the Benny? You know, and you ask for an exclusive, right? That no other competing business. Yes? Oh, kind of, but it's a standalone. It's a standalone, but is it, but, but is that standalone have other shopping in that area? Is it in a is it in a development? Uh, no. It's just a straight standalone. I mean, oh, okay, well, you didn't ask me to ask for the exclusive then, but <laughs> but but if you're in an area, you do want to ask for an exclusive, okay? <clears throat> okay, and then of course the tax jurisdiction makes sense because in retail we charge taxes, so. So that makes uh, county and city boundaries. 
uh, local laws, traffic patterns, stop light, AMP inside. Okay, so let's go. So let's talk about different types of retail. Okay, let's see how we're doing on time. See if I can get through this. Okay, we have eight minutes. Okay, so so I'll go through this fast. Okay, I'll go through this fast, and then and then we'll 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 pick up next week. Okay, uh, different types of retail. So there's freestanding retail. Okay, um, some of the freestanding retail. Uh, Home Depot these days are starting to build their own freestanding retail. Okay, so so there's some areas of Home Depot that where they just stand by themselves. They're not connected to any adjoining bill walls. Okay, before they had, but now they're starting to build more. Like Walmart super centers are now by themselves, and they'll have some other businesses that are in the same shopping center. But now they're now they've gotten to the point where now they're just building it by themselves. Some targets are by themselves, and some are still in super centers. Okay, so you'll see. Um, and then, of course, there's the super center, which is an anchor shopping centers. Okay. All right. These types of uh, of centers need to have people nearby. They will not build one of these in the middle of the desert with no one living. Okay. <laughs> Obviously. So you need a lot of people nearby. And the income, ages, races, occupations of people really depend on which ones show up. Okay. Okay, the demographics, uh, which ones show up, okay? All right, there are different types of retail. So let's go over the different types of retail. Okay, so the first type of retail is a neighborhood shopping center. And the neighborhood shopping center are normally meant for uh, 60,000 to 200,000 square feet. So a neighborhood shopping center would be a Bel Air or a Safeway or Rayleigh. Right? Those are part of neighborhood shopping centers. You have the, you know, the 50,000 square feet, 80,000 square feet for the Bel Air, right? Then you have the, you know, the, the Starbucks, and you'll have the Jama Juice and the Subway, and, and you'll have the sandwiches, and then you'll have the little restaurant, the pho restaurant, whatever it is. Those are in the neighborhood shopping centers. Make sense? So, so that's, a, that's a neighborhood shopping center. Now, Okay, you have the compute the community shopping center. So the neighborhood shopping center is a, like a one to five mile drain. So like for example, like if you live in a certain area, you always go to the same grocery store. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So like if, if it's a pretty big dense neighborhood, then you might have two shopping centers there. I mean two uh, grocery stores there. You might have a Radies and a, and a Safeway. Then you make sense. But it tends to service like a five mile radius. So if, if I'm in if I'm in Granite Bay, I'm not going to the Safeway over there in Elk Grove, right? Yes or no? No. So the radius in which we pull a demographics report is a five mile radius. You don't pull a 25 mile radius for a Bel Air, okay? People don't say, well, I really like the grapes of this Bel Air better than the one close to my home. So I'll drive an hour to the Bel Air close to you because they have better grades. No. Yeah. What about employment though? Because if you had a Safeway right here, you'd probably stop here on your way home versus, you know, trying to pull off one. Yeah, of but, but it's not really meant for that. You know, it's, it's really people when they go to a grocery store, normally they go from their home. You know what I'm saying? Like, like for example, I, I, I've been, I lived in Granite Bay for 10 years now and I and I don't even know the whatever shopping centers around here. And I, I work here for the last 20 years, 25 years. I don't know what shopping centers are here. When I lived in Elk Grove and Silver Springs, I always went to that Bel Air and the Safeway right there off Calvine, right? And Elk Grove, Florence. But since I've moved, I've stopped going there. You see what I'm saying? So normally the five mile radius is for who lives there. It's not for work traffic, you know what I'm saying? The work traffic normally is more centered around the AM, PM. That AM, PM I might go to. Does that make sense? It's close to my work, but but not a shopping center. I, I I wouldn't go buy fruits and vegetables, you know, on my way to work and leave them in the car all day long. And I wouldn't buy fruits and vegetables even, you know, here and then drive 30 minutes home. You know, I just go. I just get it when I get home. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I just I'm get trying it to shop, but I I actually get my groceries in the town before I get to my house because I can exit and take back up. So. Yeah. Yeah, but, it, but, but, but the, the, everyone has their unique circumstances, but in general, okay? So so really the surrounding residences is big for those type of neighborhood centers. <clears throat> Next is a community shopping center. 
So name me some community shopping centers. Green. No. That shopping center on uh, Laguna and Bruceville. Yeah, Laguna and Bruceville has a neighborhood shopping center. Yeah. They have a TJ Maxx there. They have a Home Depot there, right? Mm -hmm. They have a Best Buy across the street. They have, I think, a Mimi's uh, Cafe, and they, they have a uh, they have a macaroni grill, right? They have a Verizon store. You see, when you know when you know commercial, you sort of know the shops, right? There's another regional center right down the way with the Chevy's and the, the orchard that just went out of business. You know, the one on Big Hall in Bruceville, right? You have the, huh? I, 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 I sort of I, I have my feelers on everything, all right? But they have the Chevy's there, they have the India oven restaurant there. They have the uh, they have the Target in that center. You know what I'm saying? So. So that's considered a community shopping center, right? That's a community shopping center. And then you have the regional centers. The regional centers. The regional centers is the Galleria Mall. Is, so the regional center, people come from 100 miles away sometimes. Like for example, you know, uh, you know a regional mall, like for example, a regional center, you know, you know, they have those big outlet stores over there. They call them the San Francisco outlets, but they're, they're in Livermore. They're 100 miles away. They still call them Sacramento, San Francisco Premium Outlet. Why would they call them San Francisco Premium Outlet when they're 100 miles away from San Francisco? They're in Livermore. What's it called? Livermore Premium Outlet. But no, they want to call San Francisco Premium Outlet because the stores there are high end stores. Livermore, known for the nuclear labs, they're not known for high-end stores. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to call them nuclear, nuclear outlets, you know? Might get radiation. So they call them San Francisco Premium Outlet, even though it's an hour away, hour and a half away from San Francisco. It's 100 miles away from San Francisco. But it's called San Francisco. You know, it's a, it's a, pre, it's a destination, right? So, uh, I mean... Let me ask you, those people who are in Elk Row, do you guys go to Galleria from time to time? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. You see? Right? Matter of fact, my, my wife, my kids, they like going to the to the Union Square over there in San Francisco. Because they have the higher end stores. You know, they, they have the Hermes, the Chanel, the Louis Vuitton, the Neiman Marcus, that's there. You see what I'm saying? So so people will travel hundred miles away. People even travel like uh, three, four hundred miles away to go to the South Coast Plaza. Anyone been to the South Coast Plaza in Costa Mesa? That's on the side of the state. And people go there because of the high-end shopping. Does that make sense? So, so some areas have turned into regional centers, enclosed malls. So a regional center, enclosed malls, obviously, you know, Arden Mall, uh, Galleria are, are two malls we have in Sacramento. They used to have Downtown Plaza, which is an indoor-outdoor type of deal. Now they're called Downtown Commons. You know, uh, there you there was going to be they were going to turn it into a, a an outlet store. You know, they, they were going to build an outdoor mall in Elk Grove, but I don't I have no clue what they're doing. I don't I, I think they're still doing the outlet. No, no. They stopped it. They they clean it. It's land right now. Oh really? Really. Oh my wow. God! They spent so many millions of dollars to build all that. Dude. I think the builder they bought the insurance company. Did they burn it down? Yeah, it is ground yeah. right now. So, wow. um, it's 500 million, uh, I don't know how much. Yeah, that, that puts so many people out of business. That puts so many people out of business. Just so you know, unfortunately, that center puts so many people out of business. But oh, it's 102. I'm actually late for class now. OK, so anyways, uh, remember, we're, we're on this part of the class. I'll see you all next week. Please sign in. Next week, we're going to have a sheet. So when you come, you'll just check your name off the thing, right? You're officially in our role for class. So I'll see you guys later. See you next Where's week. The, uh, uh, it's in the front. Oh. Ask the front oh, desk. Okay. I'm a little late again, but I'm here. All right. Yeah. Uh, on video. OK, good. Good, 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 good. You learn, you learn good things. Thanks, thanks. All right. Hey, Cameron. Good. Thank you. Hey, Maddie. Hi. Um